Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Libby Casey. I'm the politics and accountability anchor here at the Washington Post. And it is my pleasure to be joined here on stage today by Marla Beck, the founder and CEO of Blue Mercury. Thank you so much for talking with all of us. Um, it's great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you. Blue Mercury, of course, is a luxury cosmetics retailer founded back in 1999, right here in our very own Georgetown. Yeah. Marla and her partner and husband, Barry Beck, grew the business into a national beauty chain. Uh, in 2015, they sold the business to Macy's Inc. for $210 million, and we'll certainly talk about what that's meant. Uh, for your job these days. Before we begin, though, I want to remind you that you can ask us questions, ask Marla questions. Um, use the hashtag on Twitter, post live, and we can get those and share those with you. So just to start out, give us a sense of, because we, we all know the brand Blue Mercury and where sure. it's at now. Where did you start versus where you are now in terms of your, your what you had, what you were creating, and, and, and where you're going? Yeah, so we started as a beauty e-commerce company in 1999 uh, when I was in my 20s, uh, so a long time ago, um, back during the first dot-com boom. And uh, we quickly realized we were a little bit too early, and so we moved straight from clicks to bricks and started opening store locations. And we started with one store location in Georgetown in Washington, D.C., and had that one location for a while till we figured it out. And so today we're at 180 locations, uh, but it has been a long journey. We've been through two recessions, um, and uh, certainly the dot-com bust in 2001 had a huge impact on us. Uh, but the um, the original idea uh, for e-commerce was really fun because um, I in graduate school I had met this obscure entrepreneur uh, who came to talk to us about the internet so this is in 1999 and we had um, I had just gotten my first email address uh, and Google didn't even exist and so here this entrepreneur was talking to us about e-commerce and what it was all about and I was completely intrigued and he explained how he was going to sell books on the internet uh, this <laughs> happened to be Jeff Bezos uh, nobody <laughs> knew who Amazon was uh, only 30 people showed up for the talk wow. um, but I was completely inspired and so that's how we started as a beauty e-commerce company I just wanted to bring beauty products to the internet a reminder for people who are under the age of like 30, yes. back in the 90s, this was the day of dial-up. I mean, this yes. was, you did not shop online yet. You guys were way ahead of your time. Yeah, in fact, we were too early because we launched our internet site uh, in 1999 and nobody was shopping on the internet. And so we were all shopping, all the e-commerce founders were shopping from each other and that was about it. Hmm. And so we were almost bankrupt within the first six months uh, because we were too early. And so- and you had a million dollars in investment, in investors? Yeah, so it was an interesting time. It was an easy time to raise money. I say a little bit like today, uh, we raised a million dollars in in two weeks to start the company. Uh, and this was just a function of what the internet was like at that point in time. It's, I sort of liken it to the CBD cra cra craze today in terms of how people are raising money, it's crazy. Um, but uh, we raised a million dollars in two weeks and we were off to the races. But it was a different time. It cost a million dollars to build a website back then. And all of a sudden, there were five other competitors that had raised 10 to $20 million. And so we knew we were in trouble. We went out for follow-on funding, and everyone said, no, no, there are too many competitors. We can't give you follow-on funding. Now, what benefited us back then was you could only buy cosmetics at drugstores or department stores. Uh, so our beauty e-commerce idea, although was too er we were too early, the idea of a store was actually revolutionary because 90% of luxury cosmetics were sold at the department stores. There were no freestanding beauty stores. And so by opening a store in Georgetown, we were one of the first freestanding specialty beauty stores. Uh, and stores actually uh, let you touch customers and actually um, were revenue generating, uh, unlike our e-commerce site, which didn't really generate much revenue back then. Uh, so we really, I mean, they call it a pivot now. We had to pivot and change our strategy. But back then, it was called a failure, and we were almost going out of business. <laughs> so I love the business terms that sort of make it good for the failures, but um, no, pivot, we pivoted. <laughs> did you have to convince investors that it was time to make that pivot? Um, did you just did you have to trust your own instincts? Because you, know, you said that you were able to raise so much money because the internet was sort of hot and a yeah. brand new thing. Yeah, it was really difficult. So our first set of investors did not want us to open a store because they believed in pure 
internet e-commerce plays. That was the pitch. That's what we had pitched them on. They didn't want to change course. And so we raised money from a separate set of investors for the stores and then combined the two businesses ultimately. But, but you know, the internet businesses were getting multiples on eyeballs. And for stores, it's a very straightforward sort of metric, which is, you know, how much revenue, how much profit, and how much capital did you put in? And that was too um, common for the internet investors. And so we really did have to change how we were talking about the business and how we were pitching the business. And um, during uh, the 2001 NASDAQ crash, there was no capital. So the angel capital and the venture capital closed up shop. And so we ended up getting bank debt for a while on our inventory. Uh, but there was no way to raise additional capital for stores after our first two stores. Uh, so we really had to bootstrap and just figure it out on our own. Um, so it was, it was a different time in terms of raising capital. We ultimately raised capital from an angel dinner club. These were common back then where a bunch of people would get together um, and hear pitches and then throw in money. And we were really lucky because Ted Leonsis and Steve Case were actually part of the dinner club. And they had been entrepreneurs, so they saw and knew how hard it was. Uh, and, and so they threw in at the dinner club. So, But now there's a lot more angel investment and seed capital than there was back then. I want to ask you about networking for a moment, just because yeah. you brought that up, because I know I hear from a, a lot of women in my profession as well as on the you know in the entrepreneurial world, who sort of don't like the idea of networking, it's sort of seeing it as transactional, right? right? Like it does, it feels like something that's more of a more corporate, less organic, less real. How do you talk to young entrepreneurs about seeing the benefits of networking and, and finding networking like right in your own backyard, realizing you may have far more. Of a, of a strong and um, put network potential than you realize you have. So I look at it a little bit differently. I look at uh, the fact that you need mentors and you need champions. So you find mentors that give you advice. And you know, uh, women come up to me or entrepreneurs at all sorts of events and say, OK, I have this idea. What do you think? And so a mentor gives you advice and it helps you sort of make your way and figure some things out. A champion actually puts you into a new opportunity. And I have been fortunate to have champions uh, throughout my life that really helped me with opportunities. And so I think as a young entrepreneur, you're looking for both mentors and champions. So champions, uh, managing directors at a private equity firm really helped me uh, raise money. And they were the ones that introduced me to the Angel Dinner Club. Leonard Lauder from the Estee Lauder uh, Corporation. I met him when Blue Mercury was a year old, and he walked into our first store and was curious about what we were up to. And so I pitched him so hard. I'm like, I, I need to carry your brands. You know, we're gonna we're gonna change the world. And he looked at me. He said, Get a couple more stores first. Um, but I kept that relationship going. So, and it wasn't much. I would just send him a note here and there, or ask him to grab coffee. And you'd be amazed, as an entrepreneur, or even when you're a student, how many doors were open to you to ask. Um, and so I think, for me, networking sounds scary. I don't like networking, right? You have to be social. It sounds like you're meeting a lot of people you don't like or don't know. Um, for me, it's, it's that one-on-one -on -one relationship that you sort of start to develop with people just through chance opportunities. And you have to judge whether you know they sort of can turn from a being a mentor into a champion. But I look at that model as the most important. And it's not just for entrepreneurs. It's for anyone in any career or um, even in your personal life. What do you see as, as your role as a leader in other business um, role models? What's your role in trying to cultivate new talent, encourage new talent, and make mm -hmm. sure it doesn't, it, it's not only you know, white men, in this case, of course, women are such a strong player in the beauty industry now. Um, but how do you make sure that you are staying open or, or encouraging other people to stay open to new people, new possibilities? I mean, I think for us, we're a company that's 93% women, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, so for us, um, you know, we really uh, looked at it, um, especially from the store perspective. So we started with a pretty radical human resources strategy years ago. Uh, and for us, it was all about hiring full-time people into our stores. And I remember uh, people in the beauty industry would say, you're crazy. You have to have part-time so you don't pay benefits. And I said, you're crazy. I want 
want full-time people that are dedicated and committed to providing beauty advice. And so um, what we did is we only hired full-timers into our stores. So what does that mean? Uh, people had a career with us and could develop and grow and lead. And now we have a ton of people who started as sales associates in our stores that are part of our corporate team. So I really believe in developing people from the ground up and giving them opportunities no matter what their education is. Uh, I think you can teach leadership and I think you can teach management. Uh, and I think it's a really, really important piece of your job as a leader. And uh, we are completely open uh, because of our model from the beginning. As a leader, your job is really to set the mission. So our mission has always been really strong, which is to be the best at giving beauty advice. And that helps people grab onto something that's not just uh, corporate numbers. You know, I, some companies talk so much just about numbers, but this is about a dream, a vision, and you want people to be on your team for that. Talk about the sale to Macy's. Was it a, was it a goal to to go through that process? Like if you could go back and talk to yourself, you know, 19 yeah. years ago, yeah. was that part of the dream? Was, was getting big enough and successful enough that you would catch the attention of a, of a major company? Um, I, I think when you're an entrepreneur, I mean, when I started, I just, I had been inspired by other entrepreneurs and I just wanted to change the world, right? And so I don't think you stick with something for 19 years if you're not really dedicated to it. And so for me, I'm a builder. Uh, and so I wanted to build a great company. I think what happened in 2014 is we were getting calls from a lot of different um, companies and uh, private equity firms that were interested in investing. And I started listening uh, because uh, the competition started heating up in our industry. And I felt like we needed to scale more quickly. So after you know, 14, 15 years in business, we had 60-something stores. Uh, and you know, there were other competitors out there with 300, 500, 1,000. And so I felt like it was time to scale up. We were building every department from scratch. So that's one thing as a company, you know, you start entrepreneurially and you see, you know, with Mallory, you know, who was on the panel before, she was talking about how she had one store and her staffing. Well, as you're scaling your company, you're building every department from scratch. So we were building our technology department, our e-commerce department, our finance department, our HR department. And so when you're building everything from scratch, it actually slows you down as you hit a certain amount of scale. So we wanted to take investment to accelerate our scale. The other thing is I felt like we were going to fall behind in technology. The pace of technology investment and the requirements for that were increasing. And so Macy's was the most attractive because they were the number seven e-commerce player in the country. Uh, they had the HR and finance infrastructure and they had the supply chain. We, you know, we had stores, we were trying to get product and, uh, and, um, and goods to you know, 60 stores at that point. And we, if we wanted to grow, we had to accelerate that. And so they had a set of resources that we really needed uh, and it's been amazing. What was important to me also was maintaining our DNA. You know, we're a family company. My husband and I started it. We still run it. And so I wanted to keep that family orientation. And so the promise, which they've upheld, is that we would keep our headquarters separate in DC and that we would run our own show. Um, and so we've been able to use their resources and keep our DNA. And we've scaled from 60 to 180 locations, and our internet business um, has scaled significantly. Uh, but the technology requirements for any retailer continue um, to change and evolve, and so we're investing a lot there. It is so fascinating that one of the, the ideas initially of Blue Mercury was to break out of the mold of the department store, yeah. right? touch the products, yeah. um, be able to choose from a variety of products, not just yeah. go to one counter represented by one company, a different counter that might sell a different product. Yes. Um, what is it like to see your products in a store like Macy's? Um, and explain how that retail relationship sure. works out versus the standalone stores that you have. So the difference with Blue Mercury is our staff are trained in all brands, as you mentioned. And so a client walks in and you can help um, the client with any product. And traditionally, department stores have been counter by counter, brand by brand. So you come in and you shop with the Bobby Brown brand or the Clinique brand. And so what we've done is we've put Blue Mercury locations in Macy's sites. And so that's interesting because the client can walk in and rather than go to the counters from Macy's, they can actually experience what it's like uh, to shop among brands and what's what we've found is they don't even notice that they've changed shopping environments right away they just think it's part of Macy's but a lot more brand selection and so it's been a great partnership
ownership, they're actually applying some of our human resource models to their form of cosmetics. And so it's been a great partnership. They're learning from us and we're learning from them. Mm. Was, it, was it hard to make that decision to, because this really was something that was such a family business as you talked about. And you and your family are so invested in it, not yeah. just in terms of the finances, but just the, the creative control, the vision for it. It was really hard. I mean, Blue Mercury was our first baby. We had Blue Mercury before we had our three kids. And so um, that was a very, very difficult decision. Um, you know, I was worried I was going to lose control. Um, and as an entrepreneur, you know, some, sometimes people become entrepreneurs, and especially me, is because you want to control everything you do. And I'm a little bit of a control freak, so <laughs> yes. Um, but we've been able to maintain that. And so I feel like it was a good decision. And I, th I think the competitive pace of business sometimes is that you have to hit scale more quickly today than maybe you did in the past for some businesses, especially for large retail chains that are um, competitive. So I, I, it was the right decision and you know, our staff's happy. Their benefits are were much stronger than ours. So, um, and so I think it's given them um, more of a career path too. To go from 60 to 180 locations provides your team with a lot of opportunities to grow. A reminder, you can throw your questions into this discussion if you're in the room or if you're watching online. Just use that hashtag post live on Twitter. You were a disruptor when you started this company, and now there is so much disruption in the industry. Yeah. How is Instagram affecting the beauty business, and how are you learning from people even like your kids yeah. as they are so oriented, I'm not talking about your children, but, but yeah. teenagers generally, the preteens are so oriented to what they're seeing online, how they're learning from their peers, how they're learning from these role models they find on social media. Yeah, I think, you know, for beauty, um, Instagram provides a marketing and opportunity that did not exist before, where it's very democratic and you have a lot more diversity in terms of what's available on Instagram. It's fundamentally affecting categories of the business. So what's interesting is the mask category, uh, facial masks, was so teeny in the business. Okay, and so facial masks, like the masks you put on. Yeah, like the Brady Bunch masks. Masks. Cleanse your skin. <laughs> yeah, you leave it on, or... they look black, you know, you peel it off after 10 minutes. A great uh, idea from someone my age, but it's like, sh was shocking to me to learn that like 13 year olds are also You into know what, it, it's a statement. Yeah. So if I wear a mask and I take a picture, I, it means I'm taking care of myself. It doesn't mean necessarily that I've found the best mask ever. Right. Or, um, so it's a statement teenagers are making um, to each other, um, but it's exploded the mask business and the lipstick business has exploded because if I change change my lip color, I'm actually changing my Instagram picture. So it's fundamentally affecting pieces of the business. The other thing we have is Instagram first beauty companies. So it's also creating new business models. So Kylie Cosmetics built a $500 million uh, business just through Instagram and her digital site. That is, w would have been unheard of years ago. Uh, we, there's another brand called Winky Lux that built their whole business via Instagram, and now they're turning the retail model on its head where they have a store in New York City, they charge you to go into the store $10, but every room is Instagrammable. And they sell a little bit of product, but it's all about Instagram. And so, but it's a r new retail model. And so Instagram has fundamentally changed the, the business models and how people purchase cosmetics. How does it affect your business? Like, how, how does it affect what, everything from how you learn about products and what's trending and yeah. what might be something that's gonna be popular for a couple of months, so you might wanna carry it for a little while or learn more about it versus something that's gonna be a tried and true long-term seller? Well, I mean, it gives you such access to customer feedback right away. And so it's increased the pace at which we change our merchandising, which I think is really fun. It used to be, you know, we went into the stores and talked to customers, we interviewed them, we emailed them. Now you get instant feedback. Every day you can look to see what's trending. And so you have to make, you have to be a merchant and decide, you know, what's important, but you also get great feedback right away about what's important in the, in the business. But by knowing your customer and know, staying true to your customer, you you know how to react to it. You've created your own beauty product lines. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how much of you goes into that? I mean, how much are you testing out products? Talk about why you decided to go into the creation business and not just sort of the retail side of things. I think, you know, I 
I like to solve problems, and so um, back when we started our first brand, M61 Skincare, uh, we had a lot, of, a lot of clients coming in, into our stores, and I'm in the stores all the time because I'm fascinated by um, talking to people. Do people um, know it's you? Like, do, or do, do they uh, recognize you? Some do, you and they? some don't. Um, so it depends. Um, so we had clients coming in saying, I love natural products, uh, but they don't do anything to my skin. And we other, had other clients coming in saying, I love the dermatologist doctor's brands, but they're full of chemicals. And so we saw a need that wasn't being met. We created M61 as the most natural cosmeceutical line on the market with vegan skincare in 2012. And so then we just created Luna and Astor, a vegan cosmetics line. Also, because we saw clients wanted vegan, uh, low chemical cosmetics. And so by talking to customers and seeing the gaps in the market, you actually can bring product to market more quickly. And yes, I am active in every little bit. I'm obsessed about cosmetics, always have been, and so I do all the product development uh, with our team. So um, something really important to me. But um, beauty has always been a great place for entrepreneurs. Uh, female entrepreneurs like Estee Lauder, Elizabeth Arden started there. And so for me, it's so intriguing to see how many new beauty entrepreneurs there are every day. And that, that's my favorite thing about the industry. When you meet um, new entrepreneurs, mm. young, but let's leave room for other entrepreneurs who aren't always, you don't have to start when you're 20, right? You can start a little no. later too yeah. with, a, with a career change or a new idea. How do you know, how can you tell as someone who's been through this that they have, they're, they're ready, right? That they know the market, they know their product, um, they know the risks that they're taking. What are some signals to you that someone uh, is prepared for what they're diving into? Um, it's when they have this burning desire to solve a problem and nothing is going to stop them. I don't, I don't think you have to know everything. I mean, I, I go back to how naive I was when I was in my 20s starting a business, which is I just had an idea. It was actually, a to my idea was a total failure within six months. But I got in the game and I was close enough to the industry and what was interesting to me that I figured it out. So I think most entrepreneurs, their first idea is probably completely wrong. But if you have the passion, you stick to it and you figure it out. And so I think it's all about being ready to just drive. Entrepreneurship is tough. I mean, Elon Musk said it's like eating glass. <laughs> Some days it, it, it is really tough. Everything can go wrong for you. Uh, so you have to have that passion and drive to get through it. And like I said, the idea itself doesn't matter up front. <laughs> Do you have to have a passion and drive for the product or the idea that you have? Do you have to have a passion and drive for the customers? I mean, you can see sort of the, both sides. Someone who, for example, loves jewelry design, loves jewelry making, but has to learn a lot about the market and learn a lot about commerce versus the other model of someone who might be really steeped in business school and know a lot about um, marketing and know a lot about how to raise capital, but do they also need that passion to create something? I think it's hard to start and stick with it if you don't have that passion. I mean, I, I think, you know, before I started Blue Mercury, I had been in private equity and I was buying janitorial maintenance companies. And so, yeah, I knew a ton, I had a business degree, I knew a ton about that sector, but I never would have started something in that business. I wasn't passionate about it. And so you have to start something that you have a passion for. It just it makes it easier. And so it's marrying that business expertise with that passion. Any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Um, you know, I, I think we're all entrepreneurs every day in our lives. And I think exercising that creative mindset is really important uh, for everyone to do. So um, this is a creative job for you? It's a creative job. Yeah, that's where I get excited. New ideas, uh, talking to new entrepreneurs. You know, we get to carry their products. So I talk to new entrepreneurs every day. So um, being creative is an important aspect, I think, of self-actualization. So I encourage everybody to find a way to be creative. Great. Thank you so much, Marla Beck. That's all the time we have this morning. Um, you can, of course, watch this later on if you'd like. If you'd like to share parts of the conversation, go to WashingtonPostLive.com. Thank you so much Thank for talking you. with us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for being here.